Good evening, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. I'm your host, Dave Cruz, and let's begin. Author Kevin Jeffers has been helping people retrieve their lost or incomplete souls through the process of passing over for many years. His new book, The Pattern of Exploration of Consciousness, points to a pathway for people to experience more self-awareness and manifestation. You can find more about Kevin by going to www.thepattern.pub. And this is his first time on Beyond the Strange. And once again, I just want to thank you for being here tonight, Mr. Kevin Jeffers. Kevin, thanks for being on the show. Thanks, Dave. I'm very happy to be here. So let's get a little background of um, your experience, why you got how you got into this, like, you know, how old were you, that kind of stuff. Five. Wow. So I think some people describe me as a natural sensitive. Okay. I think that's an accurate description. And it doesn't imply anything more than that. So it's like a baseball player in the big leagues is a natural athlete. Whether they make the team and whether they stay on the team is really dependent upon their performance, their training, and their ability to size up the situation and respond accordingly. So for me, I had a series of experiences basically for the last 65 years. And um, they seem to have built one on top of the other in a very logical way, in hindsight, a logical way. When I was going through it, it seemed kind of messy and irrational. But when I stopped to put the pieces together, I said, yeah, that brings me today where I have done um, a lot of these various activities that have expanded who I am. Okay. And um, I am very well aware that you've had NDEs. Is that correct? Yes. It was a very disappointing experience. <laughs> Please share. Well, I went through a very difficult time of my life, and then I got to the point where I actually released out of my body very dramatically, very emotionally, and I started cruising to what I called the portal of light. Okay. This was well before the days of uh, definitions of near-death experience, tunnels, angels singing, so on and so on. For me, at that time, it was just a portal with light emanating from it. And then I, be, I came closer and closer and closer and I was gonna step through because I was at that balance point, do I, do I stay or do I leave? And a very luminous figure steps out from the portal and I'm ready to go. I wanna see what heaven looks like. I'm assuming I'm going to heaven. I wanna see what angels look like. I wanted, you know, really, experience it on a first-hand basis. And this yeah. entity put their hand on my chest and looked at me and he said, no, and pushed me. And I went right back to the body. Mm. So I didn't even have the, um, I didn't have the ex full experience. I was barred from the door. It's like an unwanted guest. Out you go. So Can that's you, what I mean. Uh, it's, I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm saying this, that's what I mean. It's not, for me, it isn't what you have been reading about in your death experiences, where there's all the bells and whistles. The body died, floated above the body, went out to the ethers, went to the gates, the tunnel, as they call it now, went through were given a life review, given choices, of which I've done all this since that time, but really on my own volition. But at that time, I didn't get any of these uh, experiences. But what I did get, Dave, which was critical to me, now I knew where the portal was. This guy, it's like uh, going someplace and you really don't spend a lot of time sightseeing or visiting. You go someplace and you leave. 
you now know what it looks like and how to get there. So that was the benefit to me of this experience. Uh, I didn't have any dramatic triggering of skills, talents, um, unusual experiences at that time. Let's uh, let's go back a little bit to that being that you encountered when you were experiencing this. And first of all, can you give a description of this being in more detail? I think you said it was possibly female, but is, is that the case? It seemed to be female, not by form and sh or shape, but by energy. Okay. I like women. Dated a lot and married one. I know what a woman the energy a woman gives out. So okay. using, using my own two senses, I said, oh, this is a angelic form that is feminine. Because it's not even woman, it's just feminine. So and it was approximately a, a female shape, but not, not exactly, not specifically. And it was translucent. And it was what what it encased was what I call core self. It's a it's brilliant light that emanates from the inside outward. So it's a very powerful uh, image, very powerful experience. Because at that point, I just had an idea what these folks look like, and they didn't look like that. So I'm thinking, where's the wings? Where's the halo? Right, right, right. Yeah, no wings, no halo. Just like a meeting between you and me at this at this point in time. So you're the gatekeeper and you don't want me coming in because it's not my time to pass. You would probably with love very gently push me away. Very interesting. What surprised me was how rapidly I went from point A to point B. Hmm. I'm being pushed and then I'm back in my bed. So the speed of thought. It was, it, I couldn't even comprehend the, the time it took to go from here. I just have no memory of that. I got the push, I ended up in the bed. But then interesting, all of my negative thoughts, all of that energy I built up, it was gone. I've had no impulse to do what I was, what I was up to since then. Because I realized that this is a this could be a fascinating life. If you shift how you look at it from being a victim to being uh, your own champion in life. And that was a critical shift for me because it gave me the confidence to experience more. It didn't deflate me. It didn't make me sad. Okay, I didn't go there. I'll get. I'll go back. I'll figure it out. I'll go back. So there was that level of confidence and certainty that I walked away from this experience with. That really wasn't present before that. I'd done amazing things, amazing to myself, but the contact with the light was was a game changer. I can't even begin to imagine what my experience would have been like if I had passed through that light portal. Uh, maybe or maybe I wouldn't come back. I don't know. To me, it's a, almost like a waste of time to speculate what would have happened. Yes, I understand. So before I ask um, a, a, a follow-up question, I want to ask, um, with this experience, of course, when this being said these words to you uh -huh. did it did it feel like it was audio or was it through telepathy um energetic beings in my own experience communicate through what i call data packets oh interesting okay they send data out so i say packets because it looks like a cube or a circle or triangle and it once it contacts you then it starts to open up and it sounds like words, but it's not words. There's no vocalization. Right. Okay. There's no error. How could they be talking to you unless they're talking in your ear 
we're near over there. It, you know, just it's too complicated. So there was no talking, no sounds. There wasn't a band playing. It was just a knowledge, a knowing of what I was, of what someone wanted to communicate with me. But and you I can make out be, forms. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. No, I'm just saying, I find that to be true in my soul retrieval experiences that when I'm with someone, we're not talking words because we're in our energetic bodies. I'm sending data to them and they're sending data back, but it seems like it translates in a moment of time. Right. So you have the entire message inside you. You just have to process it because that's the way we're trained. We process data piece by piece in a linear fashion. Okay. All right. Get on board with that. Um, let's talk a little bit about your book. And um, you have it's it's called the pattern uh, and exploration of consciousness and. I'm assuming you're calling this the pattern for a particular reason. So can you please describe why you call this the pattern? I've been writing that book for 30 years. Writing, editing, leading, keeping. And at a certain point, I experienced what I call the pattern. And that experience flowed out from a meditation where I went out, shifted consciousness to a higher plane, and which is what I usually do. But then instead of going to the higher plane, I went to a space, a reality that I saw some, I saw like the planet Earth with a grid behind it. And the grid became sharper and clearer as I, I came closer and it was a very emotional experience. It's like getting in touch with who you really are could be an incredibly emotional experience. So the, the grid, the background were luminous, was luminous and a bluish white color. And I don't think that really matters that it was a grid and or a specific color. What mattered was that I saw for the first time the intelligence behind consciousness. Very interesting. Okay. So such, you know, such an impactful experience that I decided to title the book The Pattern because the, the this event was the crowning of a look, many, many years of expansion and knowledge and experience. And, but the cap was the experience of what I call the pattern. An exploration of consciousness is just simply exploring what consciousness is, not in physical matter, though that does occur, but more on spiritual reality. Well, let's go there for a minute. What, what would you, um, for you, what, what would you say is um, consciousness? Consciousness is the ability to process significant amounts of data in a, in a real-time environment and the, the quality and the expansion of consciousness is, builds on that experience of energy or reality, what, I, what we call consciousness. Consciousness is, evolves, it grows. It may not happen in a lifetime, but it could happen in many lifetimes, but it does grow. Um, that's what our job here on Earth is. Experience this Earth reality with the intent to remember who we are, which is, in my view, a, a much more poignant, a much more um, dramatic understanding of ourselves. Mm. Now, before you started getting into these experiences and you started defining these patterns and typical, um, I guess you would call them um, 
Uh, phrases uh, like consciousness, like uh, dimensions and portals and stuff like that. Did you have any experience in, with um, like scripture or religion or anything like that that you might have reference to? I generally avoid that. I find that religions are contained with their belief systems and we wrap ourselves in our belief systems regarding that religion. And I find that it's, it's a limitation of who we are. And I'm not saying religion is bad. I think religion is wonderful. Let me get that on the table right away because it creates a frame and a structure for us to grow. But I have been around the world for 35 years and I find that religion is just a religion from a culture is a point of view on the experience of the spirit in reality. So the adoration of a God makes complete sense to me. But I try to avoid getting enmeshed in that and, and look to see how I can lead my life in a way that I'm comfortable with and in a way that expands my consciousness. To be, to be factual, you can expand your consciousness through prayer and meditation, but you, you pretty much need to be in a set-aside place, like a temple or a monastery where you don't have distractions. So religion is very, very important to create a frame and a structure of what our potential for consciousness is. So in other words, it has its purpose. It has a purpose, absolutely. And I would say that again and again. Um, I would never say there's no purpose to religion because I think that's childish almost, if not so. Yeah. <laughs> religion serves a purpose. And the question is, what is your purpose? What do you want to accomplish? Do you want to be um, attached to dogma or would you prefer to have your consciousness be free-flowing and creative? Right. There are, that oh, way. I'm sorry. That's okay. There are saints that are that way. They're, they experience consciousness as a free-flow, energetic um, state of being. But I think the saints are not quite like regular guys like us. Hmm. That's interesting. I'm go back. We'll get back to that. Um, personally, like um, you know, just a little bit back on religions. I know that I've been through quite a few myself as far as denominations. Never Catholic though, interestingly enough. Mm -hmm. But um, I have experienced the Mormon Church, okay. which is pretty fascinating um teachings and one of them has to deal with uh predetermination where before you enter in, into this world or realm um there's an idea that before you're born you're predestined or ordained to fulfill um different missions or roles uh in life uh it's like you know the God's plan for you and, and that kind of thing. Um, how do you feel about that before a person enters this world? Do you feel that, that they already know what they're supposed to do and therefore they choose it before they enter it? And as they grow, they start learning their purpose. I think a good point you just made was it's choice. Yes. Okay, so you choose to be, <clears throat> use an example, an astronaut. Dave, the astronaut, when you come in, you say, I'm going to be involved with jets. I'm going to fly in the sky. I'm going to go to incredible speeds, maybe go out into the galaxy. But how do you accomplish that? It's you have the capability, the instincts, the understanding of how to do that. You're born with that. You're born with a template. And the choices you make within the template depends on how you interpret and act on your personal requirements for growth and expansion. 
So you may come down here and you're going to be an astronaut. A lot of kids say you want to be astronauts. We just say if that's the case. And you grow up and you go to this school, you go to that school and you decide um, what I really want to be as an artist. I want to create art. And there's a, there's a bit of a grind uh, in the push and pull between your soul objectives and your physical reality. Mm -hmm. So you came in, you knew you were going to be an astronaut. That was going to, that was going to give you this space to expand yourself. But then you thought maybe or decided that art is a better way to do that. So you come in with a template and framed within that template are goals and objectives for the life. And what you do with it is what you do with it. Many people are fairly notorious for not, not fulfilling what they've set out to do because they go in another direction. So that's the free will component that I see all the time is each of us choosing how to achieve what we, this inner drive that we have. And the inner drive is pushed by the formation of potential consciousness when you're still in spirit. Okay. I like that. All right. Uh, well, we better not deter from my question. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm notorious for that, by the way, Kevin. <laughs> you can, you can deter on. all you want, Dave. That's very cool with me. Love going on different tangents because, you know, when I get a, a guest and I, I just love to pick their brain. So uh, I appreciate that. Yeah. So um, getting back to the pattern, um, one of the questions is, what is the purpose of the pattern? It, it, I call it the neural network of God. Okay. It's like a brain. Have you seen diagrams of brains? It's an interweaving network of energy lines. And the energy is sent out to for sight, for eating, for smell, for moving. It doesn't have to be programmed, pre-programmed, because it knows what to do. And the brain is very much involved in your survival. What we do with our life is the learning experience. So I would say the, the pattern is just simply uh, a network of consciousness that acts as a guide for us. So we, many people say, well, I, I meditated and I talked to my guide. There's a chance that you're talking to yourself. And the reason for that is that you are conferring with your higher self, your total self, on what you need to be doing. There are guides. Don't misunderstand me. But mostly we're talking to ourselves because our self, our higher, our higher self is much more reliable and knowledgeable and experienced than our physical self. Very interesting. Okay. Yeah. I've um, always kind of confused about the higher self. I've always heard about it, but I've never really learned exactly what it was. So I can share my experience when you're on the other side and you're the, you're in this place called heaven, which is the city of lights from, as I see it. Mm -hmm. And you're training to be born. Believe me, you train, you just don't show up here by accident and you take on the capabilities, the abilities to transact your life in a way that fulfills your intended function. So I would say that each of us taps into that energy of super consciousness. And what is super consciousness? From my experience, well, who I am now is a fragment of who I am there. And the, if all of that were piled into one body, it would burn itself out. Right. You know how rarely angels or higher plane individuals come into the earth is because they find it very uncomfortable. So they look for humans as intermediaries. 
like a Moses was an intermediary between people and God. And the, the list of intermediaries goes on and on and on in all religions, in all cultures. There's always someone who translates that and they do it very effectively so they're remembered. But there are many more who make the translation and they implement it, but they don't get the name recognition of the saints. And I would tell you, Dave, that each of us at any moment have the potential to be an intermediary between our families and our and our and our acquaintances and friends and spirit. I see a lot of that in psychics. Mm, psychics, psychics seem to collect information from out in the sky, out in the air, and they bring it in and they interpret it and, and give it to the person who has requested their service. They have that ability to collect the data and to send it out because that person is unable to do, to do that themselves. Because if you could do it yourself, why would you need someone to do it for you? Right. Very interesting. Okay. Um, how did this change your life when you became aware? Of the pattern? Well, it really started at the age of 18. Okay. I'd had experiences, I'd seen things, I really didn't fully understand what that was. And I, I got into a mode of discovering who I am in my relationship to spirit. So when you make that intent, when you, when you formalize the intent and send it out in the universe, you get a message back. And the message back to me was, okay, it's time to start. So I started doing past life regressions. I was in a meditation circle for a couple of years with the old, with ARE, the Edgar Casey group. And that was like sitting around and meditating and reading from a book that I didn't particularly understand. So I decided to step out on my own. And the universe created a hypnotherapist who was doing past life regressions and 40 years ago, actually longer than that, um, that was not even talked about. What you hear today didn't even exist at that time. Mm. I remember now, 50 years ago, I was 18, there and about. It didn't exist. So if you went to, if you were to go to someone and say, I'm doing a past life regression, they would have serious thoughts about having you committed. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine that. Because nobody wants nutcases running around hurting people. So it was, it was like underground. It was like word of mouth, friend to friend. And I was lucky enough to find a certified hypnotist who was interested in this topic. And he would push me down into a level of consciousness. And I call it down. So it was like down through the brain. Mm -hmm. um, that allowed me to open doors to see where, when I had lived, where I had lived, and what I had done. So it was always with full consciousness, but it was like putting the body asleep and waking up the mind. And that continued to evolve. I started doing healings from that state, healings on myself, healings on others, the data flow from the feedback I received was very good. So that's where it started. So does hypnosis, and please forgive me, I, I don't know a whole lot about hypnosis. I just know what it is as far as, I've never experienced hypnosis, let me put it that way. Um, Hypnosis, doesn't that work with the subconscious and not the consciousness? First you, have to, first, you have to entertain the conscious mind. And you entertain it with the object swinging back and forth or in a circle or many different ways to entertain the mind. And then the mind starts to relax because it's focusing on, say, the pendulum. And you relax and you relax. And then there's also the audio suggestion by the hypnotist 
as to what the hypnotist wants you to do, where they want you to go. So in conjunction with the, the body resting at rest and a suggestion of the hypnotist, you can be pointed to an experience or you can be pointed to a place. In his case, because it was past life regression, he had me go backwards to a really startling experience that I had a long time ago. It was an open, kind of an open-ended question. Mm -hmm. So I started there and then continued and went on and on and, and finally got boring. I said, okay, I've been around a long time. I had a lot of lives. So what? How does that help me today? So then I realized that I had access to data. I had access that I did not need hypnosis or prompting to go after. Okay. So with this healing, um, you, well, excuse me, with this experience through hypnosis, you were able to start doing these healings. Uh -huh. And um, um, do you, do people have to be under hypnosis for healing? I'm just asking. I, I don't know. No. Or, re or regressed or anything like that. Well, it's preferred that you're relaxed. Okay. That's, that's the only requirement because if you're conscious and you're fighting this, it's going to be difficult to, to connect with you to create a healing environment. Healing is just the, the collection and transfer and um, direction of energy. And the, the key point on that, what I, as I mentioned, is collection. For me, other people are much smoother about it. It's like I pray for the energy to come into my hands, and then I direct the energy out to a destination. The, in the meantime, I'm still seeing that person in their body and what's required, but the energy pretty much outflows because that energy, which is spiritual energy, is intelligent. Okay, that segues into my next question. And by the way, thank you. That's exactly what I was going to ask about the healing is how does it work? So thank you. Yes. Um, when you refer to spirit, can you just, just describe what this is? What spirit is, is, is what physical is not. It's a dichotomy. Spirit is an energy and an intelligence and a consciousness that far surpasses physical reality. Because it's where we come from. Right. We often look around and think this is where we came from. Well, I had a mom. I went to the hospital. I was born. I came from there. But you didn't come from there. You just simply are visiting here with goals and objectives and targets in mind. And then you die. And you move on. Um, if you wanted to live a thousand years, I'd strongly recommend against it. Because I promise you, it would be an incredibly boring experience if once <laughs> you experience everything, then you experience it all over again and again and again and again. I think having a finite existence is a, is a benefit to us. Now, the dying part could be very uncomfortable, very painful, very distressing to family. But it's just one one aspect of being alive. I mean, your your poor mom went through probably 20, 24 hours of labor to create you, bring you out into, into life. And this squalling baby who was doing all kinds of weird things with their bodily functions, not attractive. No. So you're born and you die for a purpose. If you came in to love to learn to be that astronaut and you were fulfilled within your mission in life at what point is enough enough so maybe you become a trainer pilot maybe you come like tom cruise and lead a bunch of jets around That's even cool. that after a while gets boring anyone who does the same thing again and again and again once they've mastered their skill life skill 
they <clears throat> do get bored. If you maxed out on your creativity and your intelligence and you just keep hitting your head against the same ceiling, you will be bored. I've never met anyone who wanted to retire that became bored because they, they just felt that being bored was the death of them, which is sometimes true. Mm. We, all, we all know when we're bored. It's because something is repetitive. It keeps happening again and again. The shape doesn't change. The reality doesn't change. So why continue to do that for a long, long period of time? I mean, you can keep reinventing and recreating yourself, but there's an end to that strength because this is physical reality. It's probably some people can change their reality. That's interesting. But most of us can't. Let's let's stop there for a second because I want to ask you a question about being in this reality on this plane. I've talked to people and I feel that I might have experienced it myself in some way where a person can astral project. Mm -hmm. And in that projection, reality can change. Because you're moving into a spiritual plane. So, now, there's an, interest, there's an interesting book that was written by a uh, contractor in Iraq named Natalie Sudman, who I've chatted with, amazing person. And she was blown up in an IED. But she was given the opportunity when she went out of her body to recreate her physical reality in a way that would serve her greater purpose. So okay. she found it interesting about having been blown up, being conscious, and being able to change what happened. There were five people, I believe, and three of them died. One guy stepped out on the scale, but Natalie had her look. I think it was her right hand got blown off. Mm -hmm. Side door slammed into her body. I mean, really bad stuff. Banged her head up. So in that, in that, in spirit, there is no time. There simply isn't any time because everything is happening now simultaneously. So she was able to step out and play with her body, change it in a way that allowed her to go on with her greater purpose. So yes, we can change, but we need an extra, well, usually we need an extraordinary experience for us to change. And I personally would not want to get blown up and find out. No, neither would I. As much fun as it is to be on the other side, reshaping your body, um, I just can't wrap my head around being blown up and being put back together again. No, but that would be, sounds painful. It's painful, and then there's a recovery period, and then there's limitations from things that you chose to stay blown up, like she lost an eye. Um, mm. Yeah. It's just something you don't want to do a lot. Be interesting to hear her story. It's in a book. Natalie Sudman, S-U-D-M-A-N. A very interesting okay. person. Well, let's definitely look into that for sure. And it's a, it's for also a very family. popular book. It, 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 had, it had a lot of circulation. A lot of circulation. But as people read this book and... And I read the book for the first time. And I'm saying, wow, she went to the place that I visit. I knew where she went. I knew where things were. I knew the people there. And that's shocking to me because I didn't expect any congruencies between her experience and my experience. So having recognized it and acknowledged it, it was a more powerful experience for me. Right. Because that's, that. that's what those sneaky devils do. They get to start interjecting into our life and changing stuff. <laughs> right. So let me ask this, um, and it may be a naive question or idea, but does a person need to actually die to get to this location? 
Because you said that you know how to get no. there. No, there are two ways to do it that I know of. One is out of body experience, okay. where you literally your energetic body lifts from you, lifts from your physical body. And that's uh, it's not documented, but there are a lot of anecdotes that would suggest that's what happens. And then there's what I call conscious consciousness shifting, where you take the core of you, not the entire of you, and send it someplace, somewhere, somewhere. Mm. So Dave is still in bed. Is he still chilled out or in his chair? But a spark of him, the spark of his core went out. And when you do this, you can actually collect experiences that are verifiable. So I can send out more than one spark. I've never done more than one spark. I, I, I've heard, actually, I've read documents of saints. I keep saying saints because that has a meaning for me. True. Who have located themselves in different places. You know, my location is to the two of you and the same person in two different locations. Maybe there's tri-location or quad, quad location. Don't know. I haven't experienced it. I tend to be more linear one at a time. Yeah, I understand that. Um, I'm I'm not sure if you've uh, are you familiar with Robert Monroe? Oh yeah, I'm a fan. Me too. Yeah, I love his and books. I've taken some of his courses. The binaural beats has given me a technology to expand my consciousness. His mm -hmm travels down what he calls the highway, um, have given me guideposts in my own travels down the highway. So I'm a fan. Yes, me too. Um, I actually more recently started learning about his work and um, his book, uh, Journeys Outside the Body of the mm -hmm. Human Body. And one of those experiences it was that he had been conversating with someone i can't remember who it was but that this person had told him that they had seen him in new york speaking with um i believe was a like a niece or something like that but he wasn't that wasn't he wasn't there physically yeah he was he was he was somewhere else whether he was asleep or i don't know what he was doing but i can't remember but if I recall the story correctly, he didn't even know that. Right, exactly. Yeah, he wasn't even aware of it. So some um, spark of him went out and was doing something, and he was back in his body having a having a schnooze, and he wasn't <laughs> conscious conscious of going out. And then somebody reports on it. It's a very strong validation of the experience. Right, exactly. I, I find that fascinating, and. It truly have, you, is. have you had any experiences like that? Yes. Uh, the, sure. one I, the one I will report on, mm -hmm. some of them are fairly personal, is that my brother was sleeping and it was like two or three o'clock in the mor morning and he snaps awake and there I am standing by his door. So he's he's pretty sharp in many regards to the spirit. And he said, what are you doing here? And I winked and waved and disappeared. Oh, wow. And then another time I visited a person who was sick and they, and I reported on the circumstances. Well, your husband was snoring, which I talked to her husband later. And he said, I don't snore. <laughs> And then did a healing with her. And then when he woke up, he said, Kevin was here. He, he told me he was here. He told, he told me I snore. I don't snore. I have many, it's documented in my relationships. I don't snore. So his wife said, honey, you snore. <laughs> but that's the fun thing is that, is that you can, have the experience and validate it to some degree. My other form of validation 
is to get a picture of the room that I'm in, the colors, the furniture, and then report that to the person who I thought I visited, who said, yes, that's the way it is, and I've never been there before. So that, for me, that tends to validate the experience. Because if I can validate the experience, I'm not particularly interested in remembering the experience. Why clutter my brain with stuff that may not be true, may or may not be true? Sure. Um, okay, so we've gone over your NDE and uh, some of your experiences and that um, you were able to start healing. What prompted you to become a healer? Because I had all this energy build up in my hands with nowhere to go. <laughs> That's good. Good reason. Huh? And I, I tell you that my hands got hot. It was so uncomfortable that I wanted to send it out. And I knew instinctively what it was. I just had never done it before. So I sent it out and had an impact. And so I became, if not a believer, at least persuaded that energetic healing is possible. And in time, I found out it's real. But at that first experience, it was like, wow, what is this? This is strange. But you can tell, I, I spent a lot of time evaluating my experiences. So I'm not knowing myself that something actually happened. Right. So if I have an experience and I can't validate it, I don't even write it down or remember it. It's just data unorganized, uninformed data that may or may not have happened. So there's no point. Trash can. You don't remember any of your healings? I remember all of the ones, all of them. But I tend to forget the ones that were not successful. Because a successful healing is the validation of the healing. What's one that you, that, that would stand out to you that made you feel happy it made you feel good that's a big question okay in my book i, I tell a story okay and the story is that i was about 24 25 and i was in chicago at the time i lived in chicago and i get a phone call from my mother and my mother says your brother was in an accident when he was playing hockey and he broke his back. Oh, God. And we, I had to drive to St. Louis. It's like a six-hour drive. But mm -hmm. as I was driving towards St. Louis, it was, it was more like my concerns and worries and thoughts started to dis dissipate. And I had the sense of being filled. Filled with something, like a balloon. Felt very heavy by the time we arrived at the hospital. But my body was the same. Nothing changed. We went into the hospital, found a doctor who was caring for my brother, and he calls my mother over because, you know, that's mom. She needs to know what's going on with her kid. And he puts an x-ray up on the light box. So in those days, they had light boxes. And um, sure enough, there was a, the lower S1 and S2 were shattered. And he pointed to the fragments that were close by. And he said, you know, ma'am, I'm sorry, but your son's going to end up in a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. Because there are, too, there are too many pieces of bone. He said, the best we can do is operate and remo remove the bone. This bone is sharp. It can continue to cut and cut and cut inside the body. Right. So he said, it's late in the day. He's only been in here for a couple hours. Come back tomorrow. So we went back to the hospital the next day and I felt an incredible impulse. I mean, I'm sorry, it was that night that I arrived in town where I went into the room and I put my arms out the energy came out and then I was depleted. It was like the gas tank was empty. The gas tank was full when I walked in that room. It was empty when I left. Okay. And I had, I had no idea if I was just kidding myself uh, my love for my brother was creating a creating a, a mental something 
that something positive had happened because he's in a striker frame. I don't know if you know striker frames, but they immobilize you upside down on a platform so you don't move in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. And seeing your brother on a striker frame, that's pretty gut-wrenching. Sure. So I went to a hotel and uh, the next day went back to the hospital. And my mom said to the doctor, what's, is there any, anything changing, any, prog any progress? So I said, let me take a look. And he takes a new set of film, puts it on the light box, and he starts swearing. Something about those blank, blank, blanks down in the x-ray department, effing up the blank, blank, blank x-rays. <laughs> so he calls down to the x-ray department. He talks to the director of, you know, who handles all the x-rays. Said, what is this? Come on up. And he shows him the two x-rays before and after the healing experience. Mm -hmm. He said, I don't understand this. Because the fragments of the spine had come back together in their correct shape. Wow. So my mom said, what does this mean? He said, I think he, he needs a body cast for a couple of months. So he's not moving around and re-hurting himself. Sure. And there'll be some immobility, but he's, he's not going to end up in a wheelchair or paralyzed. So maybe something else was going on that I don't know about, but that's what I know about. So I walked into the room and he was pretty much coming around again because they hadn't injected him again with morphine. And I said, well, Mike, uh, I'll tell you what's going on. Uh, looks like you're going to be okay. Because he had no idea that he, he fractured the bone. And I said, and I'm curious. I said, what was your experience when I came in the room last night? He said, there was more than one of you. I said, well, how'd that happen? He said, there was one of you on each side, head and foot and left arm and right arm with their arms outstretched, healing me. Wow. And I wasn't going to step in the way of that experience. So I said, okay, made a note of it. And uh, they're going to move you. They're going to keep you in the hospital for a couple of weeks and then move you into the home of one of the hockey players, mother, who was a emergency care nurse. Okay. So then we turned around and went back to Chicago. And he had graduated on time. He had a body cast on. He was driving his car with a body cast on. And eventually, right after graduation, a couple of months, he got rid of the body cast. And within a year, he was playing golf. Golf was his passion, or is his passion. Still plays it. So that's a little dramatic. Hopefully, the visualization I created allowed me to communicate the experience. Yeah. And that's my go to story when I want to talk about something dramatic. Most healings are not dramatic. That's fantastic. And for that, for you to be able to do that with a family member um, and those dire consequences, uh, situations, circumstances, uh, that's amazing. And um, I think that's, that's, that's fantastic. I think um, what was very fortunate for me, my sister came with us from Chicago and she was in a, the head emergency care um, department in Cook County in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And that's right in the, the middle of the projects. So she handles gunshot wounds, stab wounds, burns every day of the week. Great. So she came in and she wanted to look at the x-rays and was very surprised to find what the doctor found. So she said later, is this, he is pretty pissed off about the x-ray, but it, it is, it's what it is. So the doctor couldn't figure out how he fractured the, uh, the, uh, the spine and how it came back together again. It just didn't make any sense to him. And that was, Verified by x-ray, by the doctor, by the technician, and family members. So I tend to stick with this picture in story because it was verified. 
So actually, when I, I wrote the book, and my editor said, put in some personal experiences. I didn't want to put this one in. Right. Because I forgot about it. It was like went out of my brain for 30 years that that happened. We kind of refer to it vaguely in family get togethers. You'll remember the time. And, but the actual experience of the healing and the progression of events, I forgot. So I had to call up every family member that was present. There were three of them say, can you refresh my memory? What was your experience? And it was all validating what happened. So it's not. Kevin did an extraordinary thing. Kevin just did what Kevin can do, what all of us can do. When you focus your life on spirit, amazing things happen. At least amazing to me. Absolutely. So I didn't want to be an astronaut, didn't want to be a, a fireman, didn't want any of that stuff. I wanted to be a better soul. I wanted to lift my consciousness. That was, that's been my goal in life and it still is. And it'll probably be until the day that I pass on. And that's something we didn't get into. Um, I had something else in mind to ask you before we wrap this up, but I also, first of all, I want to say thank you again for joining me tonight. And it's been a fascinating conversation. I'd love to have you back on the show so we could talk some more about experiences and and, Dave, and there, one more questions I didn't get to. There is much more. Yeah, absolutely. It's just, absolutely. I'm talking 50 years of experience. You know, a couple of things have happened between in that 50 year period. Oh, I'll bet. <laughs> I'll bet. That's, oh, yeah. That's quite a quite a bit. Um, but before I let you go, um, I would love to ask you to please let the audience know where they can find you and everything that's you. Well, two things. They can go to Amazon or Google and buy the book, The Pattern, An Exploration of Consciousness by Kevin Jeffers. It's very simple to do. If you don't want to spend the money and you want to learn more about this, go to the website, which is www.thepattern.pub, short for publisher. And we have a website. We've been working on it and starting to like it. It's starting to come together. And that really goes into this in more detail than I presented today. Today's just been like a sketch. And we created a lot of visuals because this is really um, a subjective experience in the sense that you cannot document it other than the ways I told you before. So we, we provide illustrations and all kinds of interesting things to highlight the experience, not explain it. A lot of this stuff I cannot explain. Sure. I just know, I know what happens. So go to the website, take a look. I think it might give someone a better idea what, what's going on. And then they can ask, they can send emails to info at thepattern.pub. And those go directly into a pool of uh, questions. And there are a number of people who are interested in this that have been helping me out answer them. Fantastic. Well, Kevin, once again, I want to say thank you for joining me tonight. And um, uh, please come back to the show so we can talk some more. We've got, I've got a lot more questions. <laughs> so, well, let's um, answer those questions. I'm also writing another book called Soul Retrieval. Because okay. people, people have 40 different descriptions of what soul retrieval is. Wow. And once again, I can only talk about my own experiences, and I thought it'd be interesting to put into a book format before I forget them or get, all, get Alzheimer's or something. Right, right. I, I don't write them down. They're gone. Right, exactly. No, that's a good idea. Yeah, definitely. I'll get you back on the show, and we'll go over that. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much. Well, if you have a little bit of time, pick up the book or do a Kindle, which is a lot cheaper than the book. I love Kindle. Yeah. And read some of those experiences. 
There's the core, there the core messaging of the pattern, and then there's the personal experiences that bookend the, the story of the pattern. Awesome. Will do. Good. All right. Well, thanks again, Kevin, and um, hope you have a great evening, and I'll definitely keep in touch. Thank you. Hey, thanks for taking the time. Thank you for being on the show. You've been a great host. Really. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Okay. Take care of yourself, Dave. I will. You too. Right. Thank you. Bye-bye.